Good afternoon. Welcome to the CDP webinar, COVID-19's Long Tail, Developing a Mental Health Strategy for Recovery. This is Tanya Gulliver garcia Director of Learning and Partnerships at the Center for Disaster Philanthropy. My pronouns are she, her, hers. This webinar is presented in partnership with the New York Life Foundation and is co-sponsored by Giving Compass, Philanthropy New York, Council on Foundations, National Voluntary Organizations Active in Disasters, Grantmakers in Health, and the National Center for Family Philanthropy. And I apologize for the small child in the background. CDP starts all webinars with a land acknowledgement to recognize the original stewards of the land where we live and work. I spent most of my life in Treaty 13 territory, known in English as Toronto, but I now live in Balbantia, the place of many tongues, also known as New Orleans, Louisiana. Balbantia served as a major pre-colonial trade hub for the region and is home to more than 40 indigenous nations, including the Chitimacha, Chaka, Ataka Kapishak, Caddo, Homa, Tunica, and Natchez nations. CDP acknowledges that indigenous people have been displaced and disenfranchised from the land, not just by natural or environmental disasters, but by the social, economic, and cultural disaster of colonialism. Despite centuries of theft and violence, this is still and always will be indigenous land. Indigenous people are still here today demonstrating innumerable talents and gifts amid continued oppression and colonialism. We honor the elders, past and present, as well as future generations. Miigwech. Few reminders before we get started today. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website and YouTube channel shortly after the webinar is complete. Next week, you will all be sent a link to the recording and the slides. Live captioning is now available via Zoom. Click on closed caption live transcript to access it. We will have more accurate captions in the recording. You can submit questions at any time using the Q&A box and we will try to answer them at the end of the panel presentation. If you're on Twitter, please use hashtag CDP for recovery, that's the number four, to share the discussion. And at the end of our webinar, there will be a short survey. Please complete this to help us improve our webinar offerings to better meet your needs. Today's webinar is designed to help the funding community gain more information about the intersection of mental health and the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly the long-term psychosocial impacts of the pandemic when layered over other traumatic events. Our discussion will cover information on what professionals are seeing as individuals, families, and communities, whether the stresses of illnesses, death, and the economic impacts of the pandemic, and what we might be alert for as the pandemic continues. We'll also discuss how funders are responding to such a widespread and ongoing crisis with an eye toward reaching local communities, sharing knowledge, and convening experts and service providers. And to set the stage, we are reading daily about the toll the pandemic is taking on first responders, healthcare providers, parents, teachers, teenagers, and really all of us. We know from prior research that disruptions to routines, poor access to care, and compounding losses complicate recovery from trauma and grief. In addition, the severity of reactions may be heightened due to pre-existing physical and mental health conditions, isolation from our social networks that bring attention and security, political power that gives communities a seat at the table for determining their own recovery, and economic capital such as income, stable housing, and insurance. A large-scale Center for Disaster, sorry, Center for Disease Control study from March of this year found that more than half of people working in public health at the state, tribal, local, and territorial levels during the pandemic reported symptoms of at least one serious mental health condition. Nearly 12% of the 26,174 public health workers surveyed 
said that they had received job-related threats since the start of the pandemic, and nearly 25% said that they had felt bullied, threatened, or harassed because of the nature of their work. Overall, according to the CDC survey, 53% of respondents, more than half, reported symptoms of at least one adverse mental health condition in the previous two weeks. 37% relayed symptoms of PTSD, 32% depression, 30% anxiety, and uh, just almost 9% suicidal ideation. Suicidal thoughts were more frequent for workers under age 29, people who are transgender or non-binary, and those who identify as multiracial. There is no doubt that a mental health crisis is upon us and will continue to demand our attention. And now I wanna to turn to our guest. Dr. Drea Canales holds a PhD in clinical psychology with prior work in family studies and intercultural studies. Drea is a clinical services assistant and educational consultant at the Headington Institute where she facilitates service for aid workers, emergency responders, and community caregivers, and provides consultations and trainings on resilience, vicarious trauma, and complicated grief to client organizations. Heather Nestle is president of the New York Life Foundation, our partner in this webinar, and it's the charitable foundation created by New York Life Insurance Company. In addition to her foundation duties, she is Vice President of New York Life's Corporate Responsibility Department. The New York Life Foundation has two key focus areas, educational enhancement and childhood bereavement support. It is one of the leading funders of childhood bereavement support in the U.S. and has committed more than $60 million to help children and families navigate grief and loss. Sally Ray brings more than 28 years of experience working in the nonprofit world and a passion for community and social service to her role at CDP as our Director of Domestic Funds. Previously, she served as our Director of Strategic Initiatives and the Director of the Hurricane Harvey Recovery Fund. Sally is familiar with the long-term mental effects disasters can have on a community after working with disaster response and recovery organizations throughout Oklahoma. Welcome and thank you to our panelists for taking time away from your work to speak with us today. Drea, I'm gonna to start with you. You have a clinical practice providing trauma and grief therapy, focusing on systemic factors, race, cultural dynamics, and social location. And your research centers around culturally grounded understandings of resilience, trauma, and complicated grief among families, caregivers, and displaced communities. Can you tell us a little bit about what you were seeing and hearing? Yes, first of all, thank you so much for the honor to share. I think I could probably talk about this topic for a couple hours, so I'm going to do my best to speak to the heart of it. And I thought the best way that I could do that was to kind of socially locate myself. Um, I am a mother, I am a community member, I am a therapist. I'm an educator and I have experienced this pandemic along with everyone else. And from my situated point, I can tell you what I'm seeing and maybe that will be helpful. Um, as a clinician, we are getting so many calls every day for services that we just can't keep up with. Um, my caseload has been full for months and months and months. And so it's that feeling of desiring to help more people and there's just not enough therapists that can answer the waves of people that are, are needing mental health support. I was talking to a colleague and she said that she heard that people that are calling suicide hotlines are having to wait 45 minutes sometimes. And as a clinician, that's just not okay. You know, those 45 minutes could be um, life or death for somebody. And so there's a way that in addition to the pandemic, we see this big wave of mental health need that is, it feels like multiple waves crashing down upon us. And um, another way to socially locate myself is I grew up on the big island in Hawaii and growing up, the natural disasters we were always concerned about were tidal waves. 
And so I remember as a kid hearing those sirens go off and the, the invitation to go up Malka, go up the mountain to get away from the water. And I think this has felt like multiple tidal waves kind of crashing down. And in specifically in my clinical work, you know, I have the chance to work with people that are a lot of resources are, you know, well established in their careers. I have clients that are undocumented and are struggling to pay their rent. So the full kind of social spectrum of um, resources and all of them are experiencing higher levels of trauma, higher levels of anxiety, um, processing through grief that is both present and past because what we know about grief is it often pulls forth all the other grief, grieving um, losses that we've had in the past. And so in a nutshell, it's been a process of really listening and sustaining and walking with people through processing trauma and doing a ton of grief work. Um, and then on another front of my life, I work um, with Headington and I am working with humanitarian aid workers internationally. So just this week, I was connecting people fleeing from Afghanistan who are either humanitarian aid workers or who are people that have nonprofits in Kabul. And they are reporting very high levels of PTSD and burnt out and moral injury. And so linking them, you know, linking the helpers and the caregivers in the international front. Um, and then, you know, we're also getting calls from ICU nurses that are saying, hey, I know you work with humanitarian aid workers, but in the ER or in the ICU, we feel like we're at war. You know, we feel like we're burning out. Our, our levels of alcohol consumption are higher. I'm talking to doctors that feel suicidal. I am trying to care for my family at home, but also come in and, and provide life support for all these people. And so kind of in a zoomed out way, it feels like the same stressors that we are supporting people with in Lebanon and in Afghanistan and in Sudan and all these crisis areas are parallel experiences to what our community caregivers are experiencing domestically in the US as well. So I'm talking about doctors, nurses, therapists, uh, firefighters, police officers, uh, nonprofit workers, social workers, and parents and teachers that are also, you know, ex absorbing so much trauma in a way that leads them to have their own responses. And I know I, I could talk for a long time, I'm gonna slow down here, but we see rates of about 40 to 85% of vicarious trauma among helping professionals. So that's kind of almost like a secondary trauma of all the stories absorbed, all the pain absorbed. And so I see that as a problem because we need those people to stay around for a long time. So I'll be talking more about that in a little bit. And lastly, what I see is a resemblance to the research that I did in Nigeria, um, looking at internally displaced people due to Boko Haram um, uh, terrorist groups. And these were people that um, were uh, very devastatingly pushed away from their ancestral lands that were um, experienced traumatic loss in the most brutal ways you can imagine. And we were able to communicate with them through focus groups and, and other surveys to say, what does grieving look like for you in a grounded, culturally embedded way? And I think part of what we discovered is that the grief they experienced was multifaceted. It touched all areas of their life. And they also talked about how Boko Haram had specifically targeted their rituals of grieving because they knew that if you target somebody's rituals of grieving, you can get them stuck in their state of grief. And I'll talk more about that later, but those are the areas that I'm seeing at this time. Wow, that's that's a lot. <laughs> and it is a lot. Um, you know, we're I guess heading into month 19, 21, something I can't do math anymore. But this doesn't seem to be over by any means. So what should we be anticipating as the pandemic persists? Mm -hmm. Yes, so there's some interesting research that came out. Um, 
And it's interesting that on Saturday, we're going to be remembering 9-11 20 years later. And there's some interesting research that came out on babies that were born um, in during the time of 9-11 and a follow-up study, a longitudinal study that was done, I believe, in 2006. And it was among kindergarten teachers working with kids that were born at that time. And they were showing big differences between the, the health and well being and learning ability of children that were born one year prior and one year uh, when 9 11 took place. And I say that just to say that we don't know. We don't know the impact of this on children's development, on there's no way to kind of perfectly forecast um, the impact, but we do know that there is an impact. And so for that reason, we want to be so thoughtful about intervening and also not just reacting to it, but thinking strategically. So I'm so thankful for this webinar and for the hearts and minds that are present here to think about this together. Um, another thing I'd like to say in terms of what should we be anticipating is that this pandemic is not a linear thing. I was talking to a friend of mine who works with disaster mental health specifically, and she said, you know, a lot of times if there's a hurricane, there's an event, and then it stops, and then there's recovery, and there's more of a linear trajectory. But with the pandemic, as all of us have experienced, we thought it was going to be, you know, a month, two months, we thought it could be over, but there's waves of it that almost feel more circular than linear. And I think that that's also true of our losses. They haven't been one dimensional. They have been holistic losses where, you know, people that are in disenfranchised communities have lost their jobs, have lost um, family members, have lost basically every category you can imagine. And therefore the recovery needs to be also holistic because the losses have been holistic. Um, and there's one concept that I was thinking about in preparation for this, and that was the idea of conservation of resource theory. And it's a fancy way to say that the research shows that those with resources are more likely to gain more resources as they go along. And those that do not have access to resources are more likely to lose those resources. And so let me just paint you know, a really clear example for you. I might have the access to go and, and have therapy uh, myself and to get that mental health support because I have the money, because I have a car, because I have time, because I have childcare. Um, and then if I go to therapy, then I'm gonna gain resources for my mental health, or I can have enough money for my job to pay for health insurance so that I can get medication, so that I can control my anxiety, right, as an example. And then if I can control my anxiety, I can continue working and I can continue providing for my family. But what happens if there's a person that is undocumented, that doesn't have a car, that doesn't have money, that can't reach a mental health clinic, they can't access medication for anxiety, they can't access um, quality therapy that will help them move through their trauma. It starts to those without resources end up not being able to access resources, which has a ripple effect. And so I think with that, there's this, um, this beckoning to recognize the importance of helping people both with internal resources, but also thinking about what are the external factors around children and their families and their communities, um, as well as really thinking through how are we going to be providing for these caregivers? You know, how are we going to be making sure the therapists and the doctors and the nurses are going to be sustained over time? because this isn't going away in, you know, in, in tomorrow and the impact of it certainly isn't. So how do we kind of take that model that we've been using in, in Headington to say, how do we help the helpers stay, stay sustained in their work? Um, you know, I will be super vulnerable here and say that with all that I've been carrying, I, I, I had migraines for about five months. I had a migraine every day because in the midst of my work, I was also caring for my son at home, doing kindergarten online and being involved in our community and all of the losses that even my own family was going through. 
just because we're caregivers doesn't mean that we are in, um, exempt from grieving and loss and trauma ourselves. So my call would be, how do we think about really prioritizing not only the clients or the people that are in need, but also the caregivers' mental health? And lastly, to say that because of this construct of complicated grief that I researched in, in Nigeria, we know that when there is PTSD or trauma connected to loss, it is extremely hard to move through the grief well. When you lose somebody suddenly, or you lose somebody in a violent way, or a way where you can't be with them in their death. So we think about all the people that have lost loved ones in ICU rooms um, and haven't been able to be by their side. There needs to be an intentional effort to work with people through traumatic grief or else people could get stuck there for a really long time. Drea, um, I think this next question really touches or ties into that. Um, you know, a lot of folks have experienced multiple traumas, climate related disasters, violent conflict, illness, economic deprivation, bereavement, grief. grief. What does healing look like for those folks? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, it's interesting because I, I don't want to overstate the point, but thinking of kind of the extremes of grief, you know, in that uh, community in Nigeria, the, the Boko Haram people purposely would make the widows um, do the opposite of their rituals. So if you were meant to carry the body to a certain part of the land to bury it in ancestral land, they would force the women to carry the bodies instead of the men. They would force them to be buried in ways that were considered unsacred. And so part of this is, is learning from that model and saying, how do we help people grieve well? Um, and not just the, the clients that we work with in our practices and not just the people out there, but how do we help the caregivers, the firefighters, the doctors grieve well? And a big part of grieving well, when you think about a construct like complicated grief or prolonged grief, is this really interesting um, idea of when we have a bond with somebody, when we have an attachment with a spouse or a child or a grandmother, our brains actually light up with dopamine when we, or have a dopamine drop or however you wanna say it, when we think about that person. In other words, our bodies and our brains are wired to seek proximity to people that we love. So there's this yearning element. When we lose somebody, that bond doesn't go away. So if I, you know, I lost my grandmother through this and my mind yearns to think about her, my, my brain longs to remember her. But if I lost her in a tragic way, um, and, I, and I kind of did, then when I go to think about her, my brain goes there. My brain also gets flooded with um, traumatic content that can, gets me stuck in this horrible bind of wanting to think about the person, but then the trauma flooding in. So part of what we need to do is be able to train therapists and lay leaders and nonprofit workers and social workers in trauma-informed care that can help people navigate the nuances of not just grieving, but grieving when there's trauma involved. And that involves kind of a, a process of exposure to the source, but also a strategies for moving through it. And I wanna mention um, Catherine Shear is a psychologist that I really admire. And she developed a lot of wonderful resources around complicated grief. And she is through Columbia and has a wonderful center there for grieving and helping people do just what we're talking about. So I won't go through all the theory or all of it, but if you're interested in that, I can definitely speak more to that piece of it. Um, but how do we help people create new rituals? You know, how do we help people that normally would gather to eat together or would, you know, from their cultures, it's important to be with the body in order to grieve but we can't be with the bodies because they're not able to be with us. How do we create art opportunities for people to symbolically um, express their pain both personally and collectively? And then secondly, I think for both 
clients and, and beneficiaries, but also the, the caregivers. It's also kind of this two-handed approach where on the one hand, it's helping people to grieve deeply and grieve well. Um, and on the other hand, it's how do we help people become more resilient if this is gonna have repercussions for the next 10 years. And part of that is helping, you know, from our research, we know that there's, there's several factors that really build more resilience in our work with humanitarian aid workers and first responders. And that is how do we help people reconnect to meaning and purpose? How do we help people foster a sense of community and connection even when we're having to social distance or um, physical, physically distance one of ourselves? How do we be creative about connecting people? How do we foster occupational stability and well-being in the infrastructures of our community? Because, you know, I work with some clients and I could be talking about their past trauma, but if they can't pay for their rent or they can't take their daughter to the doctor, how are they going to be able to focus on their relationships or these kind of more intricate parts of their story? We have to start thinking about mental health as holistic, that the whole person in front of us matters, not just their brain, not just their emotions, but their whole life. And I think that this requires professionals to be thinking more holistically about in every sector, whether that be in faith communities or in doctor's offices or therapist's offices, we need to think about the whole person and the whole community. And that is the, the true way that we're gonna be able to see sustainable change. And that means looking at how do we develop individual self-efficacy for people through fostering you know, these resilience and grieving processes. But how do we also think about on a collective level, collective efficacy um, in empowering existing communities to come together to make decisions for themselves, to collectively access resource, resources and to collectively mourn and honor their losses together. Right, thank you, Drea. Um, Heather, I'm gonna turn to you the New York Life Foundation has been addressing grief and bereavement for a long time. Um, how do you understand your role as a philanthropic organization in navigating the impacts of COVID-19? So I think it's important to note that, you know, the New York Life Foundation is the philanthropic arm of New York Life Insurance Company. So I think the first thing that we had to do as a company was take care of our own people. Uh, think about, you know, um, how are we going to provide support for our folks to be able to live in this in this temporary, hopefully normal? Uh, the first thing we did as a company was announce that we would make no layoffs for the year of 2020. We very quickly pivoted to give people the tools and equipment they needed to work at home. And I think we also coached our managers to make sure folks had you know flexibility and just trying to figure out how they were going to be managing all the varied aspects of, of this new life. So you know caregiving at home, um, caregiving for not just children, but for seniors, um, other, you know, things they needed to take care of. And so really taking care of our people was the first thing. The second, as a philanthropic organization, was reaching out to our current grantees, offering flexibility, seeing who needed general operating support instead of programmatic support. And that answer was everybody. Offering emergency funding where it was needed to some of our grantees to help keep them afloat, frankly. And then understanding the effects of COVID on our beneficiaries, pivoting some of our programs from in-person to virtual. Um, interestingly enough, in 2020, New York Life was actually celebrating our 175th anniversary and we had some big plans. Um, one of them is that we allocated $1.75 million to provide what we were calling Love Takes Action Awards um, for people in the community that were showing you know, selfless efforts and so we, we decided we were gonna go ahead and do that, but we were gonna pivot and focus all of those funds on people who were working to provide relief for COVID related um, issues. And so, you know, we really just, I think, quickly looked at how we could offer support and how we could pivot for our current grantees and our current programs. The next thing we did, like most funders, was look at our immediate funding options and provided, you know, millions of dollars in just immediate disaster funding related to uh, acquiring PPE, um, helping folks, uh, you know, 
launch a response. So we provided funding to CDP, to the CDC Foundation, and other organizations like Project Hope for that purpose. Um, a little bit more, um, more along from a time period, we also started to work on vaccine hesitancy, providing funding for the COVID Collaborative and Ag Council efforts, providing funding for the Navajo Nation to get vaccines out to that population, which was particularly hit hard by COVID, and then starting to consider what our long-term support was going to look like, especially um, in our focus areas. So for example, how could we help children who've lost a parent or a loved one due to COVID? How do we help schools tackle um, the grief of losing somebody and also the secondary grief that so many children and families were going through around you know, missing graduations and not having um, any in-person time in school. Um, we also utilized our expertise and our network to provide general guidance and support. We held a lot of webinars with education and bereavement experts on a wide range of topics, how to speak to children about loss, uh, caregiving advice during COVID, self-care during COVID. And I think the largest um, decision we made as an organization was um, with the Cigna Foundation starting the Brave of Heart Fund, which um, we contributed $25 million to, to provide grant funding to the families of healthcare workers who lost their lives fighting COVID. You know, we really equate them to the firefighters of this crisis going into the burning building while the rest of us are literally asked to stay home. So uh, those are some of the ways that we approached COVID. And, and frankly, we're still looking at how we're gonna approach COVID because this is a long-term um, a long-term issue and we're gonna to need to be planning for it for a while. We are definitely in for the long haul and appreciate you um, and the work you're doing. What, um, Heather, have you learned from your partners about the scope of loss related to COVID and the complications of addressing it? I think as expected, the scope is huge. I don't think you can find one corner of the globe where the scope isn't huge related to uh, anything to do with COVID. But I think a particular example is our work in schools. So we have a program called the Grief Sensitive Schools Initiative where we train our um, agents and employees to go into K through 12 schools, public and private, and present an array of resources for those schools to help students when they return to the classroom after suffering a loss. Um, so that program really was about going physically into the classroom and, and presenting in front of teachers and administrators. And so we obviously moved that uh, virtually. So it started to slow down a bit. And then all of a sudden we saw a huge explosion in schools and school districts who were interested um, in, in providing GSSI. So for example, the entire New York City school district is currently being trained in GSSI. There were some schools in New York City that lost more than 100 members of their school community. And so when you talk about scope, you know, they are looking at every possible, I think, method and tool that they can use to prepare um, their school communities for um, dealing with what has happened and what will happen. And then obviously with school being virtual for so long, reaching people was a huge impediment, um, not just for that program, but, you know, more broadly. For our bereavement partners, you know, they saw an influx of new people who had suffered a loss from COVID. And this was also a triggering event for many who had lost ones prior to COVID, but, you know, who now needed more support. One of our partners told us that the average caseload for their counselors doubled based not just on new clients, but on the increasing needs of current clients. Um, we were also, you know, hearing about just a lack of referral options, especially, interestingly, for private insurance. So where usually having money, having resources um, is, a, is a tool and, and something that helps you to get access. Um, right now, it seems that the, some of the public insurance programs and the public programs that some of the states are running have more counselors readily available than uh, private. And so everyone is booked. And so that then, you know, brings folks back to the bereavement partners who they've been working with looking for more support. Um, we heard interestingly that virtual peer groups were often popular with newer clients, but that for many who had previously been participating in in-person peer groups, the virtual setting felt lacking to them. And so now these organizations are grappling with how best to move forward in this new normal, knowing that they'll need to provide hybrid supports of some kind, probably forever, but trying to figure out how to do that to support people who need to be in person and people who also prefer to, to you know, um, connect virtually. And then I think, um, you know, as we heard before, burnout among, you know, bereavement professionals dealing with their own loss and these increased caseloads is huge, similar 
to what we're seeing in the medical profession and people starting to think about whether or not this is something they're able to continue to do, which will you know, be another issue that the field needs to deal with. Absolutely. Um, so what are your strategies for partnering with particular organizations? So from a disaster relief perspective, I think where possible, we'd like to concentrate on preparedness. You know, the, the whole um, theme behind the GSSI program is for schools to be prepared so that when a child does experience a loss, they know what to do. So they're not just turning to these resources when a crisis occurs. Um, I think a good example is the work that we supported with CDP to include you know, bereavement resources in the disaster toolkit so that responders are prepared to deal with this aspect of a disaster. Um, we have a program with a group called First Book that allows them to send curated books on loss and bereavement to schools in an area that's affected by a natural or man-made disaster. So, you know, like a school shooting, for example, they will send um, books that help the school administration and teachers and even families um, talk to children about death and loss and start having those conversations. Having these things at the ready is, is a key part of our strategy and why we look to partner with organizations that can help us prepare. I think more generally, we do a lot of convening with our partners. This helps to bring them together to share best practices and collaborate, which we can then support you know, those collaborations. And it also helps us to identify gaps in the sector. And that leads us to pursue new opportunities that will benefit the entire community. Um, we, we often use RFP programs to discover new organizations or ideas that we can work to bring to scale. We have a program in the bereavement field called Grief Reach that's administered by the National Alliance for Children in Grief. Um, and allows us A, to get more money to smaller local places. So our, our, you know, our reach can go across the country. And then we bring these same local groups together in our convenings and it helps us to bring back knowledge and tools that can then be used at the local level. So it really goes both ways where we're learning from these local groups, you know, ideas and programs that can be brought to scale, but then taking some of the best practices and tools that are at scale and teaching those local organizations how to utilize them. Um, for, you know, for GSSI again, you know, is a great example of a collaboration our you know, main uh, nonprofit partner there is the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement. They provide the content for the website. They assist in large scale webinars and consult in crisis situations. But we pulled in first book to provide those curated books for our schools. We're working with the PTA to engage parents, um, all with the goal of creating this larger partnership that is aimed at supporting students in the classroom. And definitely partnership is key. Sally, let's hear a little bit more um, or hear a little bit about CDP's grant making. Um, you, at the beginning of COVID, had the privilege of funding in both domestic and international arenas. How do you assess needs to determine where you'll make your investments? Thanks, Tanya. Um, well, before each grant making round for the CDP COVID-19 response fund, and now for any of the other funds that uh, I'm directing the grant making for, I write an assessment of need that I use as a guiding document for visioning what that round will focus on. To do this, I review current data trends, reports from Johns Hopkins, the CDC, the WHO, are all on my weekly reading list. I follow the vaccination levels and caseloads and morbidly the deaths I also read information about current research, what's working, what's not, what's on the horizon, what mis misinformation is taking hold. I have lots of conversations with fellow funders about what they know, what they're funding, what they think the needs are and will be. And I've had probably 350 many meetings, many of which you sat on with me, Tanya, with grantees and potential grantees to get the inside track on what they're seeing on the ground what the funding gaps are for them to do their work and where exactly the greatest needs are and might be. And then finally, once we identify where the COVID hotspots are, I reach out to community leaders, local people to fully understand what's happening in those hotspots. We used to call this local outreach shoe leather philanthropy, but because I literally went to that local community to see and to learn, but now we must satisfy, must ha we have to sa satisfy that need for local interaction with alternatives. So I call it Zoom leather or Zoom philanthropy. And I hope that at some point we'll be able to do the shoe leather kind again soon. 
I hope so too. Um, and you started to touch on this, but once you've determined the location, how do you get, you know, hyper local? How do you identify those organizations for potential funding? Well, you know this about me, Tanya. <laughs> my first outreach is to what I call the CDP Brain Trust. And you're honestly first on my list of that brain, in that brain trust. I know that you're keeping data, um, updated information on responding organizations, national and local ones. And all our team is funneling that sort of information to you to keep and to share. But beyond you, we have folks on our team living in the US from coast to coast and border to border. And they help us maintain relationships locally that are critical to our work. And beyond staff, we have an amazing board and advisory council with specific knowledge of other locations, both domestically and internationally. And we also um, maintain great relationships with a host of nonprofit organizations, national, international, and local groups, people we already know who do amazing work on the ground. And then we also maintain great relationships with other funders community foundations, corporate foundations, and other local funders that we know and work with regularly. I call on our friends in the funding business a lot. Our focus is always to fund as local as possible in communities and populations that are most disproportionately affected. And of course, that shoe leather or Zoom leather philanthropy is key to our learning always. And when you're talking about the folks that are most affected, um, we're often talking about Black, Indigenous, people of color, um, people with disabilities, seniors. So what does it mean in your work to use a lens of equity, diversity, and inclusion? Well, we, we often say at CDP that every, disaster, every funder is a disaster funder. We say that because we know even if you fund mainly in education or children or health or mental health, all of these issues are affected by they're exacerbated by a disaster. We also know that these issues that must be addressed post-disaster are actually root causes. They're systemic issues that have to be considered for us to recover, to build resilience, to build back better. At CDP, we're committed to finding ways to create real transformative change. I listen, I learn, I try to understand what my privilege sometimes makes hard for me to understand. And we strategically invest in organizations that serve and, and quite frankly, are led by those marginalized communities that are always most disproportionately affected, the ones you mentioned. Sometimes that means funding organizations that are advocating for systemic change for the communities and populations they serve. Sometimes that's not easy grant making, but it's fruitful grant making. And it is important for us to add our voices in that support. And one way we do add our voices is through the funding and, and funding that work. That, that they need to do for the communities they serve. Sally, you've made a ton of grants, um, more than I ever thought would be possible in um, one year or 18 months. Um, but tell us about a grant that you believe is particularly promising in the area of mental health and, and why that's so. Well, you know, Tanya, <laughs> we did a lot of early funding for mental health and psychosocial support, both domestically and internationally. And, and we're still funding it, even with our current round. Um, that was part of our assessment. This is still a high need. And our current round is currently in the review and approval stage and includes um, several opportunities for funding in this area. It's a continuing need. It's honestly kind of difficult for me to pick a favorite, but I'm gonna use our grant to Vibrant Emotional Health as a, a great example of an organization that gets it and does the work to support mental health during disasters and even not during disasters. Since 2005, Vibrant has administered the National Suicide Prevention Hot Lifeline, which is a nat national network of over 170 crisis centers that provide support to people in suicidal crisis or are otherwise experiencing some sort of emotional distress. In 2012, they began to administer the Disaster Distress Helpline as a lifeline subnetwork in recognition of the increasing frequency of disasters in the US and their significant impact on our, our community mental health. The DDH is a resource for anyone in the US or its territories who are experiencing emotional distress in the aftermath of disasters. 
And then in 2019, Vibrant acquired Disaster Psychiatry Outreach, a nonprofit organization that coordinates psychiatrists on a volunteer basis to provide immediate mental health support following disasters. This led to the establishment of Vibrant's Crisis Emotional Care Team, which promotes individual and community resilience by providing on the ground mental health and emotional support following disasters, emergencies, or crisis events across the US and internationally. Vibrant also provides education before and after traumatic events to help organizations and communities better understand the emotional impact of disasters or other crises and how they can support each other in their recovery. And they provide education to mental health professionals, first responders, and others who are working with survivors of trauma. Though the crisis emotional care team was already operational at the time we funded Vibrant, we knew there was a significant need to, for them to scale up, add personnel, begin strategic outreach, they needed the capacity to respond to the significant emotional needs being seen throughout the US. And by building their capacity for response, we were and are building emotional resilience throughout the US. And as this pandemic rages on, this grant had an 18 month term, longer than most of the other grants we were making at the time, because we knew that length of time was required in this case, probably longer. And as the pandemic surges on wave after wave, we're now considering additional funding for Vibrant to continue to sustain this important work. We were and are committed to supporting this long-term. Thank you. Um, Heather, do you have an example of a grant that um, you wanna sort of highlight for us? Sure, um, there's a couple. I mean, I think, you know, directly related to COVID, we are working with Tuesday's children on providing, providing supports for children who've lost somebody to COVID. So over 140,000 known children who've lost a parent or caregiver. Um, you know, just working with Tuesday's children, harnessing their experience and working in the aftermath of, you know, 9-11 and Newtown and, and other tragedies to make sure that local organizations know um, the best practices and the ways to provide support. Um, we're also working on, on a grant right now to um, provide information around cultural considerations for schools and how they handle their COVID and their um, bereavement response in schools. And the last one I wanted to mention is work that we've been doing with an organization called Judy's House and their JAG Institute, which is out of Denver. For a number of years, we funded their childhood bereavement estimation model. Um, that helps us to establish the pre prevalence of bereavement in children across the country and by state. Uh, so for example, nationally, one in 14 children will lose a parent or a sibling before the age of 18. In some states, it's better. In some states, it's worse. In West Virginia, for example, it's one in nine. Um, we await the results of more recent data that will likely be more drastically affected by COVID loss, although we're not sure yet what the extent of that will be. But in our next round of funding with JAG, we're supporting them to overlay demographic data so that bereavement organizations can prioritize communities that are more affected by loss. So for example, an organization may be setting goals based on the percentage of population in their city. So let's say, you know, 20% of the population is Latinx. So they aim to have, you know, 20% of their client base represented by that population. But what this data is going to help them understand is, you know, perhaps that population is actually more heavily affected from a bereavement standpoint, thus making it necessary for them to put more effort and resources into that community and weight that representation differently. So they may need you know, to hire more people who speak Spanish, to work with certain school districts to make sure that the children who are having a heavier prevalence of loss are getting the services that they need. Um, and this is in line with a core focus for the New York Life Foundation to be more intentional in our DEI focus with our grantees. Um, code effects will almost certainly impact these calculations as we know that certain demographics are more heavily affected by loss in COVID. So that demographic data around bereavement will be coming out in November. So we're eagerly awaiting that information. I look forward to that as well. Um, a question, um, Sally or, or Heather, um, maybe Sally, we'll start with you. You know, we've talked about the trauma and, and as Drea said, it's not just our grantees, but it's also the helpers. Um, we are all stressed. And so how can funders change um, the amount of paperwork they ask for, the, you know, requirements, the evaluation, how can we just make it easier um, for our grantees and for the organizations going forward? 
That's a great question, Tanya. And, and that's a conversation we have on our team pretty regularly, I think. Um, early on, when we were trying to do rapid response grant making, we actually completely simplified our, our systems. We asked for a one to three page explanation of what they wanted to do in a very simple budget. Um, and, and then we quickly got those dollars out the door as quickly as we possibly could. Um, and, and we continue to try to, uh, while still being um, thoughtful about our grant making and making sure that we are, are being strategic in it, we continue to address and assess, you know, what, what are the questions we're asking? What, are the, what do we really need to know? And, and how can we be as flexible with funding as possible to allow our grantees to honor their good work and to trust that they'll put the dollars in the right place and, and to do the work that needs to be done. Um, we're always uh, trying to be that way and, and work hard pretty, pretty uh, frequently to make sure that we do as much as we can to make that as easy for them. And, and we certainly did it, I think, from in the beginning stages of our COVID fund and, and still continue to try to be as helpful and work through the process with them as much as possible. Heather, did you want to add anything to that one? I mean, I would echo that. I think flexibility is key. You know, last year, we we really sort of almost went away with a lot of our reporting requirements and just asked people to provide us with, you know, a, a, a report when they could. I think, you know, you have to balance the, um, the ability to show impact and measure, you know, what you're doing with the amount of paperwork you're asking people to do. So I think we really try to look at all the fields and all the questions we ask to say, are we actually using this information? And if we're not, why are we asking people for it? And I think it goes back to the question around DEI, same thing. You know, if we're going to be asking this information, we should be prepared to work and move on that information. And frankly, we should also hold ourselves accountable to the same kinds of things that we are expecting of our grantees. So I think all of that is important. Thank you. Um Drea, I want to combine a couple of questions that have come in for you. Um, we have a question. Can you also grieve the loss of things, such as a time, place, or space? And then we had another question that I think um, could be kind of linked, which is about are there you know, special events or ways to mark transitions? And maybe this is even missed um, transitions like a high school graduation. Um, that allow us to acknowledge grief and open doors to community healing? Those are great questions. Um, my response to the first question is absolutely. I think that's one of the things that makes this so overwhelming is, you know, we, we have the overt numbers of deaths that we've lost different people every day. I hear about a new friend or family member or a client tells me about somebody they've lost to death. But then there's also the loss of normalcy, you know, the loss of being able to go to a playground when it was when they were closed or the loss of your identity. If you lose your job, there's the loss of just your assumptive worldview, you know, of the world being safe to to go up and hug a neighbor. You know, those there's losses that are so multifaceted that, yes, I think it requires us to stop long enough to pause and be still and really listen deeply to ourselves and to, to acknowledge the full variety of losses that each of us feel. And, you know, I'm listening to the wonderful work that Heather and Sally and others are doing and I'm, my brain is just exploding with all the things being done. And so there's this really um, kind of dual task of being active and, and responding to those losses, but also how do we slow down long enough to listen? And I just watched this documentary about elephants and it's so beautiful. The matriarch elephant will put her foot on the earth and, and adjust her ears to a certain degree so she can feel the vibrations in the ground to listen for where the next rainstorm will come. And then she will guide the pack or the herd towards the rainstorm like 150 miles away. And so there's a way that I think part of the call, if I could say anything is how do we center ourselves enough to put our foot on the ground, to listen deeply and to adjust our ears to listen 
and to allow ourselves to make time to recognize the losses um, and to make time to grieve them. And I think the next question, you know, when there's missed events, oh, that's so big. You know, I'm working with college students that were, were planning to move into their dorms or, you know, at a wedding that um, was missed or all these other things. And they're just as important. They're just different forms of loss. And so I think it requires us to tap into our creative brains. Um, when we're going through crisis, the blood flow tends to go to the back of our brain and to our brain stem and our amygdala. And it makes us want to react really quickly and, and rush through things or avoid things. And, and that's why being able to calm our bodies and our brains down and to connect, reconnect to each other and to nature allows us to then put the energy back towards the front of our brains where we can think creatively. Um, I know when we lost a, a friend of ours, I went with my son and my husband and a couple other people from our, our faith community. And we stood in the parking lot outside the hospital. And I, I ran to the grocery store and I bought a bunch of roses and we each stood in the parking lot with a rose and we, um, we honored the life of our, our friend who passed away by each saying something and placing the rose on the side of the sidewalk um, in front of Vaughn's. Um, and we created a sacred space in an ordinary space. And I was able to talk to my son about the importance of grieving well. And we sang together and we lit candles and we shared funny stories so that creative ability to stop long enough to say, how do we celebrate and how do we grieve? Um, I think that takes us adjusting into a different posture um, than just reacting to all of the overwhelming things around us. Absolutely. And I definitely want to learn that elephant skill. <laughs> Me too. Um, <laughs> We are uh, just about out of time, and so I want to give one more question to the panelists um, in a lightning round, so 20 seconds each. Um, so what is one final thought or thing you'd like the audience to remember from today's webinar? Um, Sally, let's start with you. I think we're in it for the long haul. Um, it's a pandemic that will likely become an endemic, endemic, like the flu is now, and the emotional and mental effects it has on all of us will be with us for a long time. We have to keep this in mind when considering projects and organizations to fund. That's why I harp on funding organizational capacity. We have to build sustainable capacity to build emotional resilience. Absolutely. Um, Heather, let's go to you next. I guess I'll, I'll take this opportunity just to, to really talk about the sector that we believe in and care about deeply and where we're likely the largest funder, which is childhood bereavement. Um, while everybody knows death and taxes, you know, few people really take the time to think about how a death affects a child and their family in all aspects of their life. And so, you know, it's really important as we go through not just COVID, but natural disasters and other things to think about how children um, live with and move forward um, through bereavement, having an adaptive response and all the ways that we can provide funding and support for them as we think about our approach to disasters. Thank you. And last but not least, Drea, what's your takeaway? How can we creatively make space for grieving uh, on an individual level that addresses the traumatic aspects of it? How do we take care of our caregivers so that they can continue to do the work? And how do we create collective spaces for ritual, um, whether that be, you know, all of the, the candles lit on the, the monument, um, the Washington Memorial, or creating a giant art piece in the middle of a town that everybody can return to in their circular process of grieving and how do we listen really well to ourselves, but also to the communities that are already doing the work to um, 
resource them, but to listen really well to what is their own agency in responding to their particular neighborhood and their particular language and their particular cultures. Thank you. And I just want to add a few uh, takeaways of our own. Um, those are great inspirations, though. So listen, ask questions, and don't assume that you know what is needed. Be respectful, exercise cultural sensitivity. Do your research, understand the issues and needs and who's doing the best work. Use shoe leather or Zoom philanthropy to help you understand real local needs. Build organizational capacity. This helps build the emotional resilience for the service providers and those that they serve and fund with an equity lens. Just a reminder that the Disaster Distress Helpline is 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, national hotline for crisis counseling related to any kind of disaster, toll-free, multilingual, confidential, and available to all residents of the U.S. and its territories. If you are planning disaster response funding, CDP, in partnership with the New York Life Foundation, has developed additional information about strategies for addressing mental health in our Disaster Philanthropy Playbook, and you can find this at disasterplaybook.org. And as our panelists have shared, there's going to be ongoing needs to assist with mental health recovery over an uncertain length of time. We have many resources at disasterphilanthropy.org, and I encourage you to check them out. Our staff is always available to provide guidance. I want to encourage you to join us for our next webinar, October 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern, as we look at how to build a climate justice analysis in philanthropy. And I want to thank Drea, Heather, and Sally for taking time to share their insights with us. Special thanks again to the New York Life Foundation for being our partner in this webinar, and to our co-sponsors, Giving Compass, Philanthropy New York, Council on Foundations, National VOAD, Grant Makers in Health and the National Center for Family Philanthropy. Thank you to all of you. As the webinar ends, a brief survey will pop up. Please take a moment to answer that. And if you have any questions that were not addressed, you can email them to me at tanya.gulliver-garcia at disasterphilanthropy.org. Thank you and have a great afternoon or evening, depending where you are.